This episode is brought to you by my friends at the Botanist Isla Dry Gin. Hmm, this bottle seems a little smaller than usual. Nope, oh, too big. Let's try again. There we go, that's right. We're gonna make good use of these later in the episode with a twist on a classic summertime backyard staple, a gin mojito. But for now, let's get down to the basics of Smash Burgers. Alright, so the BOC or bun of choice for a smash burger is a dense, chewy potato roll. These are inexpensive and widely available, but if for some reason you want to make it yourself, here's how you do it. 415 grams of bread flour, 45 grams dried potato flakes, a tablespoon each kosher salt and yeast, and two tablespoons of sugar head into the bowl of a stand mixer where they are tiny whisked until combined. Then we are combining 170 grams of hot water with 110 grams of cold milk, creating a tepid mixture perfect for yeast activation. Dump that in along with one large egg. Swap out your stand mixer's bowl so you guys can see what's going on. Allow that to knead together until fully combined and then we're going to start adding four tablespoons of room temperature butter, one tablespoon at a time. At this point you might get frustrated with your stand mixer's performance and break out the new hotness. Dump the dough in there and continue the process, adding one tablespoon of butter at a time, making sure it's fully incorporated before adding the next. Once all the butter's been added, we're going to let this knead for five minutes or until our dough passes the window pane test, indicating that its gluten network is strong and that it's ready to bulk ferment. Lube up a large bowl, retrieve our dough, optionally stretch it into a taut ball, plop it inside, cover it up, and let it rise at room temperature for one to one and a half hours. This is gonna depend on the temperature, humidity, how recently you've saged your kitchen, but once it's puffed up to twice its size, it's ready to go. We're gonna turn it out onto a well-oiled countertop for weighing, division, and shaping. First, we're gonna weigh the entire mass of dough, divide that number by five, and divide the dough into five equal pieces. Makes sense, right? Then by pinching the edges and rolling against the countertop, we're going to stretch them into five taut balls, which we're going to spread out on a parchment-lined baking sheet and start patting down so that they rise into more bun-like shapes. Cover and let rise for another 45 minutes to an hour or until the balls do not spring back immediately when poked. Looks like these guys could use a little bit more time. Once they've passed poking proficiency, it's time to gently and evenly brush them down with a beaten egg. Then these guys are headed into a preheated 350 degree Fahrenheit oven for anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes until they are golden brown and register 190 to 200 degrees Fahrenheit at their thickest point. While these guys cool completely, we can start to talk about meat. I have a selection of beefs here, all of that can potentially bring their own flavors and properties to the party. First up we have hanger steak, great on the grill, not so great in a burger. Its tough muscle fibers and relatively low fat content end up giving the burger a dry mealy texture. Next up we got some boneless short ribs. This cut is high in fat and flavor, making it ideal for burgers if a little expensive. Sirloin is a good deal cheaper, and it's got decent flavor, but not much fat. It's got slightly grassier, more mineral notes, so it's good for adding roundness to your burger. Chuck is the golden ground beef standard for a reason. It is rich, buttery, laden with fat, and relatively inexpensive, but it does have some connective tissue that you gotta get rid of. Brisket is like sirloin, only better. It brings all those grassy mineral notes and a whole lot more fat, which you're gonna have to pay extra for. Eye round is pretty horrible. It's low on fat, it's low on flavor, and this one in particular illustrates how much quality can vary from butcher to butcher. This one looks like pork, practically. And last up is ribeye. Maybe the most delicious of all the known steaks, it's practically a crime to turn this into a burger, but if you watched my recent Steakhouse Burger episode, it's the only way to get that dry-aged flavor between your buns. So now to see how all these guys perform in a Bulgarian context, I'm gonna grind all of them up and turn them into little patties for sampling. First up is the hanger steak, and like I mentioned, it's pretty dry, pretty chewy, pretty mealy, and given it's growing popularity as a steak, there's no reason that you'd turn this into a burger, ever, unless you do a cooking show and you're trying to prove a point. Next up is short rib, which is the polar opposite, full of flavor, buttery texture, and rich beefy beef notes. This is worth its weight in gold. Sirloin definitely has flavor, but it's pretty boring. Definitely good for cutting something more rich, like short rib or brisket. Chuck tastes exactly like every burger I've ever had. There's a reason that ground chuck is part of our culinary lexicon. Brisket, like I mentioned earlier, is sirloin, but better. It's got the sharper, more 
metallic flavors with more intramuscular fat to carry them. Eye round is already bad enough, but this one is particularly bad. I mean, look at it, it's weird. It's a good reason to treat beef tasting like wine tasting and keep a spit bucket handy. Last but not least, dry aged ribeye. And of course, this was the best. If you got $35 a pound to blow on burgers, this is the answer for you. Otherwise, save a few bucks and make your own beefy burger blend. I like starting with a base of chuck for its familiar burger acumen. Then I cut it with some brisket for its complex grassy goodness. Then finish it off with a helping of short rib for a hefty hit of flavor and fat. The ratio is up to you. I go two parts chuck to one part short rib and brisket. Now time to actually cook the damn thing. I've got a lightly oiled, positively sweltering piece of cast iron over high heat, onto which I'm going to drop two quarter pound balls of our ground beef blend, which I'm then going to smash using my very stiffest spatula, sort of smearing the beef as I go to prevent stickage. You want to try to get the patties about half an inch wider than your intended bun, as they will shrink, but if they're a little bit bigger than your bun, who cares? Would you rather have a burger with patties that are too big or too small? Once the patties are smashed, we're going to leave them there over high heat for about a minute until you see browning forming around the edges of their beefy skirt. Now you want to scrape as hard as you can to get underneath the patty, give it a flip, and then same thing goes for the other side. Now's the time to season with kosher salt and freshly ground black pepper. Do not let me catch you mixing seasonings into your beef. And of course the requisite yellow American cheese. And just like that, your kitchen is full of smoke and you're ready to eat a burger. But if you don't feel like setting off your fire alarms, there is hope, and it's sitting right outside next to your lawnmower and disused trampoline. Get your grill of choice up to 500 degrees Fahrenheit with your cast iron griddle inside, and you got yourself the perfect place to smash some patties. No setting off fire alarms, no lingering beef stench in the air, no angry spouse wondering why you're making smash burgers at 3 in the morning. No matter how you make them, they need to sit atop a dense, squishy potato roll, preferably one generously smeared with butter and toasted on a flat top or grill. Before getting stacked proudly with patties, your choice of vegetal toppings, I like the classic LTO, a special sauce arranged in a satanic star to summon the beast, and there you have it, a juicy, beefy, crunchy, cheesy, entirely from scratch smash burger. Now all it needs is a light, crisp, refreshing summer cocktail. While a mojito is traditionally made with white rum, the botanist's different wild botanicals make it versatile in many drinks and plays especially nicely with the foraged mint I picked in my herbs garden, or you can just get yours at the store. Drop it into my intended serving glass, cover it with three quarters of an ounce of freshly squeezed lime juice, and two teaspoons of extra fine sugar that I'm going to muddle together using a muddler. Once the sugar is mostly dissolved and the mint is good and smashed up, we're going to top that with ice. Two ounces of the Botanist Isla Dry Gin. Make sure you include all 22 wild forged botanicals. Dump that on in and top it the rest of the way with club soda. Give it a little mix with your very longest bar spoon. Get all those minty bits as evenly as distributed as possible throughout the cocktail. Garnish with a little bit more mint. Garnish with a wheel of lime. And there you have it, a gin mojito, which I actually prefer to a traditional mojito, which can sometimes be made a tad too sweet by the rum. Instead, the Botanist Gin gives it a lovely herbal profile that really highlights all the fresh mint. A perfect summer cocktail for firing up the grill this Labor Day weekend. Kick back and relax this Labor Day and have Drizzly deliver a bottle of the Botanist directly to you. And if you're a new customer, use the link in the video description to get $5 off your first order. Cheers.